All right, we'll be starting momentarily. Thank you for your patience. Hello, good afternoon. If you are live, hello if you're watching me later. Welcome to Tips, Tools, and Techniques Club at the Sewing Studio in Maitland, Florida. We're so glad you're with me. And Gabriella is running tech today, and we have got so much good stuff to share with you. Um, got a few announcements, and then we're going to jump right into this actual beautiful quilt next to me here. Uh, but before we start talking about the Bargello class, a couple of announcements. I'm sure most of you know, we've got a Florida shop hop happening um, throughout the state of Florida, 70 plus shops, and that's going on all of March, all of April. And then the Central Florida shop hop, I got to put my glasses on, is happening the second half of March. So we're in the middle of it, March 15 to 30. If you are hopping, you'll need a passport, which is $10 uh, now since we're in the middle of it. And each shop, you will get a colored strip a jelly roll strip and then a black and white one and a, a black and white one, one blackish, one whitish. And then you will get instructions to make something. And so for us, we have a banner, let's see, a banner to make um, a, a banner that says so. So we're giving you all the letters in case you want to write something else besides so. But if you visit all seven shops in Central Florida, you will receive almost three yards of fabric in the form of jelly rolls so and if you hit them all of course you'll get put in for great prizes so a 75 dollar grand prize for, at each shop and then a 50 dollar um other prize at, at, at the same shop so what i think what that is is a gift card to shop at that store so each store will have a prize for that um so if you have any questions you know i love questions so please comment uh, if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, comment either way, and we will uh, I will answer as best I possibly can. If you have a question that is not related to anything I've got here, and it's quilting or sewing, I could probably help you out with that. So hit me up with your questions. Also, announcement-wise, we have a shopping. So if you shop my favorite page or if you just need some things on the web, you can type in TTT at the end. That's your coupon code for 15% off regularly priced items. And also Gabrielle is going to put up a comment with my handout. So you're going to want to follow along after the first few items that I talk about, um, follow along on the, on the thing. So where are we pointing? Oh, oh, and there's, yes, of course we have a giveaway. So we've got some gift cards. So we've got a $25 gift card and a $10. So you have to comment a pound sign, TTT, all uppercase. We don't decide it's not uppercase, the computer does. So it's gotta be just like you see in red there on the screen. And if you comment that during the live broadcast at the end, say to the end, um, we will um, pull the random, do the randomizer and it'll pull one of those comments. And one of them will win a $10 gift card and someone else will win a $25 gift card. So hopefully that'll be you. Um, and then I want to tell you about some of my classes coming up. Of course, we've got a brand new quarter starting April 1st. And I think I have a record like 24 classes or 24 days that I'm teaching this quarter. And I'm gone most of April and most of June. So it's going to be a busy May, I think. Anyway, so I'm not going to tell you about all of my classes, but some of the ones that I'm excited about. MJ's Easy Tote. I taught this several times in the past. You may have taken it from me. I want to teach you how to make a tote bag without a pattern. So we've got a lining, we've got pocket, one or two pockets inside, we've got handles. And this is fabric that I saw like last week, brand new, just got here on the roll. And I wanted to do a little chirpunto thing. I'm not sure if it really shows up on the camera, but each of these flowers is a little puffy. So chirpunto is the idea where you're adding a little extra puffiness behind whatever it is, a teddy bear, a flower, whatever. So it kind of pops off the quilt. So this will be hanging by the bolt that it came from. It's in the decorator section. But here, let's back it back up again. Here are some more tote bags that I've made through the years. This is a class that I teach to quilt guilds when they, when they invite me. Um, beautiful rows. That, and again, anything could be a tote bag. Um, which you will see in a minute. I, I made something with the flowers for today and I was like, oh, I don't really need another pillow. So I made a second one and made it into a tote bag. 
Um, this one you've seen before, I'm sure. I used AccuQuilt uh, tumbler die on my selvage fabric. You can make your own selvage fabric and then use it in the, as a die cut. And so that is makes a great tote bag. I use let's. I used um, soft and stable, so this stands up by itself, which is really nice. One little tip that you may find useful is if you want it to stand up or be a little more defined rather than loosey-goosey, I folded these corners all the way to the, the bottom corner. I folded it and sewed very, very scant quarter of an inch just on the outside fabric, not on the lining. And that kind of defines the corners a little better and it makes it, I don't know, stand up a little better. So that's just a little tip there. And then one more tote bag I want to show you. This, um, so I took Connie's class on sublimation printing. Basically, the idea is you are printing, um, taking, a, taking a JPEG or some kind of picture, and you're printing it on paper, and then you use a heat press to put it onto fabric. So she, her her introduction to, oh, she had so many great ideas on things to do with the sublimation printer. You'll, re, you'll realize you need one after that. But we ended up, she gave us three different pieces of fabric. This is actually a velvet. And it's really interesting that the printer, it came out brighter on the velvet than it did. I can't tell you what the other two are, but they, it has to be poly. It doesn't print on cotton fabric. It only prints on polyester. But she had a million different ideas that she passed around on things you could do with a sublimation printer. So she asked me what I was going to do with my pieces. And I said, I think I'll make a tote bag. So she's probably going to use this as one of her samples when I'm done telling you about it. But this is, again, is another tote bag. Pockets, lining, beautiful handles. We have some new webbing. I don't know. Is this polyester? Not vine? Nylon. Shiny. Um, a lot of our nylon... I feel like it hurts my hands or hurts my shoulder, but this does not. It, it's just softer and it's just beautiful. So we've got a nice collection with more colors coming in. And then this was just little um, uh, trim that I just found over in our little trim section and inserted that in the kind of a circle-y thing going there. And then I just realized that the, the treatment on that piece is very similar to this one on the sides. I just kept adding, adding pieces on until it got to be big enough. And on this one, I did kind of a log cabin -y kind of thing. So anyway, highly recommend her sublimation class if you want to learn about printing on fabric. I happen to have a favorite Bible verse that I tried to get on my embroidery machine, but it's just too long. It's from Philippians. And so I printed it on, on fabric, and now I can make a pillow. So I'm kind of excited about that. Um, so that's MJ's Easy Tote Bag, and that's going to be on April 30th. Um, another quilt... If you want, if you are a beginner and you are learning how to sew, this is a beginner class, believe it or not. You're going to finish with the top. You're going to go home. Go, you may go home with the top. You may go home almost with the top, but it won't be quilted and bound. We, I teach another class that has quilting and binding in the class, and it's called Quilting Basics. But this one, you will learn how to rotary cut, how to press, how to sew a scant quarter of an inch and so forth. So this is San Julian. And if you are interested in making this and not take the class, the pattern calls for 12 fat quarters. But because I knew I was going to be fussy cutting some K facet fabrics, I got six fat quarters and 12 half yards because when you're fussy cutting, sometimes a fat quarter isn't big enough for these beautiful big prints. So just know that the pattern calls for 12 fat quarters. I got six fat quarters and six half yards. So to make this, if you don't want to fussy cut, you follow the pattern and you'll be fine. And a few more things that fell on the ground that I'm going to pick up here that I'm teaching. Foundation paper piecing. These are the two samples for foundation paper piecing. Um, and the, the best part, I think, about foundation paper piecing is you get these nice sharp points that are almost impossible with regular piecing. Yes, if you are a master piecer, you might be able to manage every single point, but I'm not sure I am. I'm not sure I could do that without paper piecing. So this is a free pattern that I've developed and that um, I share with you with the papers. All you have to do is get started sewing. So that's foundation paper piecing, and that is on May 10th. Um, I forgot to tell you, San Julian, there's a class. It's a two-part class. There's one at the end of April in the beginning of May, and then there's another one at the end of June. 
So I'll be gone the two middle weeks of June. Um, but I'll be here for tips, tools, and techniques. The only TTNT I'll miss this summer is July, by the way. Um, this is by Annie Project Bags, small, medium, large, and that is actually a jumbo, which I did not make. But it's very simple. If you have ever made or any, know anybody that's made um, a buy any bag, you know they're just about the best written bags out there. It's one of my English paper piecing projects that I carry around. Um, and this is probably one of the easiest buy any patterns. It's called Project Bags 2. And we have patterns on order. And I will help you. Um, build one of these. So you get to choose the size. There is some pre-work. You're going to need to cut all the pieces and label them and possibly quilt them. I can't remember. Um, this back part is quilted and that way you'll have three hours to make the bag and you should be, if you do all the homework, you'll get the bag finished. Um, oh, so Gabrielle is going to put up a, a picture about my t-shirt quilt. We haven't taught a t-shirt quilt in a while. And my t-shirt quilts are a little different. Instead of the blocks, boom, 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 I applique my t-shirts to the front of a quilt. So as you can see, the red and blue quilt is the background, and I have a pattern for that, and I tell you how much yardage to buy in the supply list. Once you build that in the first class, the next class, I will teach you how to applique your shirts. The best part about this particular style is that your shirt faces don't all have to be the same size or you don't have to get them all to the same size with you know, sashing strips or border strips. They can be any size. So if you have something on the side of a shirt, if you've got something on a hat, if you've got a patch on pants, whatever, you can cut it out and you can put it onto your quilt. So I have probably made seven or eight of these. I actually don't own any because I've given them all away. Just realized that I never gave one to my daughter. So I'll make one for her and that'll be the class sample so we can see how it's done. Um, yeah, so that's the t-shirt quilt and that's gonna happen April 22nd and 29th in the afternoons. And then finally, we're gonna put up another overlay called the Decoupage Trips Quilt. We keep making this kit and we keep running out of the kit, so we keep making more. It is a gorgeous quilt. I can't take credit for it. I made it from the kit also. It looks like a difficult quilt because there's all these little three inch squares. I'm here to tell you it's not, there's just a technique. It's gonna be different than the technique I'm about to show you with the Bargello behind me, but it's a similar idea. Um, and so we, we sew strips and then we cut the strips apart and then we sew the strips back together. So um, I was down in Venice a few weeks ago for their show and a vendor was had this in her back of her um, booth. And I said, yeah, I've made that. She said, wasn't that the easiest quilt? I said, well, yeah, it was, it was pretty easy. Yeah. It doesn't look like it, but it was And the border. It's hard to see the border on this overlay, but it is a gorgeous border. It's a single piece of fabric. It's a border print. So anyway, the kits are, I want to say $143. And then you could take the class, which would be a three part class to make that quilt. I own a king size, it's a king size bed. There's a little bit of overlap. Uh, but it's actually a, probably a more of a queen size quilt, but it fits on a king as well. So any questions, we're going to put up our question box, question list so I can see if there's any questions. Hello, 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 lots of people. Um, yes, Connie does have a lot of great ideas. Um, all right, so I'm still looking, looking forward. Thank you, Sue. I look forward to every TTNT also. Um, it takes me many hours to get the content ready, and it's, it's a joy every, every single minute. I love doing it. So thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, all right. And I think that was all the classes I wanted to mention. Machine applique basics. If you want to learn how to applique with a machine and, and not your embroidery machine. So that's a class. It's been, it's been filling each time. Machine quilting with a walking foot. And that's pretty much everything. A binding quilt, binding class, of course, and a quilting basics, of course, all the bread and butter stuff we're going to continue to do. So I'm gonna move this aside and I'm gonna step aside for just a minute so you can see this beautiful quilt behind me. Um, and I'm gonna talk about this quilt. So um, yeah, so for the, uh, for the quilting of it, it's just very simple uh, lines, um, 
what am I trying to say, serpentine lines. And then I got a little more creative in the background. I used a leaf. There's a lot of leaves and flowers in this. A lot of times I try to use the print of the fabric to inform my quilting design. So I used leaves and swirly, swirly gigs to quilt this quilt. I quilt everything on my Juki sit down long arm. So that was, that's how that was quilted. And then I bound it with a striped purple. So that's fun. You know, this is an old Patrick Lowe's um, print and it's really hard to find color on color stripes like that. So when I see them, I grab them because they make great binding. Okay, I have another one. So we're gonna back it up here a little. I have another one that literally hangs on the side of my refrigerator. I had to pull it down this morning to bring it to you to show. This is just another Bargello. Um, and I think, I wanna say Bargello actually started in the needlepoint world and the quilters figured out how to make quilted Bargello. And so they, and this is a different technique, but I just wanted to bring this because we're talking about Bargellos today. Um, let's see, I think I saw a question here. What was the name again of the last floral quilt with the kit in the class? It's called Decoupage Trips Quilt. And if we can find a link for the, the classes aren't quite up yet. Kelsey's out of town this weekend. Otherwise they'd probably be up. We're working as fast as we can. There's been a lot of shows and it's gotten us behind on putting the class schedule up. As soon as the class schedule is up, you will get an email from me, my upcoming classes, and you can click directly and see them. Um, so we're gonna put the, the kit link up even though we don't have them right now. They're sold out. We keep selling out. So we will we will make more as fast as possible. Uh, what was I going with that? Um, I don't know. I'll, I'll remember. So decoupage trips. Yeah. And there's another, did I, was there another question that I missed? Okay, we're good. Okay. So the quilt behind me, I didn't mention in the list of classes, but this is going to be another class. This is called no measure Bargello, and I'm holding the pattern. And I'm going to tell you the class is actually going to be in May in the evenings, May 6th and 20th in the evenings, um, because Samantha works. And when she asks for a class, I try to schedule it. If anybody asks for a class, I try to schedule it best for them. And then you guys will follow along. And I'm pretty sure this is going to be more than once because everybody's been um, pretty excited about this pattern. Um, this is one of those patterns that is on a lot of people's bucket list. And I looked for something as easy, as easy as possible to do. And I felt like this is it. Uh, as you can see, I've made other Bargello. The, the quilt that was on my bed in the overlay, that's kind of a Bargello idea. You're going to sew strips together and then cut them apart and put them back together. So um, we're going to talk about how this is made in a moment. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's the pattern. What's different about this pattern is... I'll, do an, I'll just do the overhead here, see if you can see. Yeah. So what this is, uh, these are strips that you're going to cut out, probably make a copy. She, she actually has an extra copy in there. So you can cut up the first, the cut up this one. And you're going to cut these strips up and you're going to apply them with a basting stitch to your strips. So let me just back up here and talk about this. Um, so this, this quilt behind me was made with a jelly roll. And I'm actually, I picked out a bunch of other jelly rolls that would work well. And when they come in, we're going to put them in a basket and we're going to call it Mary Janine's um, Bargello quilt ideas or something. And that'll be, I would recommend you choose from that because uh, let's just go back to the quilt again. Um, you're going to need, of course you can buy yardage, of course, but if you, I would highly recommend the, the jelly roll just to make life easy but you need two of each color. So not every jelly roll has two of each color. And then you really want a gradation. You just don't want a bunch of different, you know, beautiful colors that don't really gradate. Um, the yellow was yardage and the background is yardage and the pattern has what you need. When I laid out all these colors, there was one purple that was way too pink. So I tossed it. And then there was a couple other pieces that only had one. So I had to toss that because this uses two strips of each color. Okay. Um, anyway, so 
Okay, so let's just, this is just a, let me go back to the overhead. This is just a, a sample bunch of, I took a bunch of strips out of my scrap bag, sewed them together, uh, kind of gradated them a little bit. And then you're gonna sew, cut your background, the size they tell you to cut. And you're gonna have two of these sets, A and B. And um, I have basted the strip that, 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 I, um, that I cut from here, I basted it along the top. Somebody this morning said, yeah, I've made a Bargello quilt and that measuring thing is the, is the worst. And that's why we call this the no measure Bargello because you're just gonna cut on these lines. So let me show you what you do. You're gonna fold this up. Even with a 24 inch ruler, this is still too long. So you're gonna very carefully fold this up and you're probably gonna wanna take your ruler and check that all your lines are even. So you do a little moving around here to get all your everything lined up perfectly. And then you can see there's a, well, we're just gonna cut right on the edge there, right? And then there's a line here and there's a line. So every, where there's a line, you're gonna cut. And we have a little gap here because I may need to readjust and maybe things got off a little bit. So that gives me a little waste here just to line things back up again. And I'm gonna keep going. And there's a whole bunch of, whole bunch of pieces you're gonna need to go. I just got a little sample of it. This is the secret behind this design, this pattern. It's called No Measure Bargello. So we're gonna cut all these strips, all right? So now I've got the strips, you know, in fact, I'm gonna go ahead and cut. I didn't do this this morning. People asking questions and it was hard to answer. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut a strip. And then the second strip is out of the second, set of um, strips that I made. So now, get rid of that. There's a strip. So I've got one, I don't know if you can see that. And then here's two, and you notice uh, two has an arrow down, which tells me I've gotta go down one notch. And then eventually, you see here, there's an up arrow. This is where I change, and number six, I change to start going up. So then I'll be going up a notch. And then that's how we get this, this little curvy thing going. Some are down, some are up, some are down, some are up. So how do we sew this together? And that's also kind of interesting. Normally with the other kind of Bargello, you make a tube and you, you um, cut off a seam somewhere. In this case, we're gonna, we've got long strips and you notice the background is only on the top, all right? Just like that. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna turn this over and I'm gonna start sewing. I'm gonna start sewing here all the way to the bottom and I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna leave a partial seam. I'm gonna leave it not sewn to the very, very end. I'm gonna leave it open a little bit. And then I'm gonna flip it around and I'm gonna sew all the way till I can't sew anymore. All right, and I'm gonna cut off that excess and then excess is gonna get sewn to uh, the bottom. So yeah, that's, that's how you end up with background on the top and bottom because this excess, let me, this excess here, still no, there we go. Huh. This excess here gets sewn to the bottom here. And then I can finish sewing that. So it's one, two, three, Four. I got four different sewings per strip. And I don't know about you, but I love my leaders and enders. I got a lot of leaders and enders sewn on this quilt because I kept having to stop. So instead of stopping and possibly your thread coming out of your needle, you sew onto a little scrap of fabric and you do the next thing. So I would do all four things before I went to the next strip to sew. Hopefully that made sense. If there's any questions, please ask New Mexico. What is the pattern for the small bar jello you showed? Um, you know what? I have to tell you, that was a class I took a long time ago. I don't even remember the name of the teacher. It's been so long. I just quilted it a few years ago. Um, but if you go to Pinterest and type in bar jello, you will see a million different possibilities. Um, and I'm sure you can find one that you love. That was just a, an example from an old, old class that I took. Um, any other good questions? Thank you. Love the pattern. Made a lap size one from the jelly roll. So I think you're talking about 
the Aquilo, you're talking about uh, the Bargello. Yes, Bargello is a great pattern. It just takes a little bit of thought. So if you're, if you're local and you want to take a class and learn how to do this, please come along. Uh, afternoons in May, if that doesn't work, we'll probably do it again third quarter for sure. Um, okay, where was, where was I here? All right, now it's time to talk about probably a picture you saw on the social media or the email about this about this class, this, t or this club, and here it is. These are very three-dimensional. They're only sewn down with the little um, circles, yellow circles in the center. Also, these leaves are very three-dimensional. I'm gonna show you how to make them in a moment, and then we're gonna talk about the stems. Um, we're going to talk later about how I quilted this, these pieces in the background. So a lot to tell you in this one little, one little sample here. Um, this is an easy tote. So of course, we've got a pretty inside with pockets on both sides, lined and handles. I had to come in yesterday to find just the right green. So in, on the screen, it doesn't look like the right green, but in real life, it's the right green, I promise. Um, okay, so let's start with the flowers because they're the most fun, I think. And, hmm, oh, it's in the bag. It's like, where did I put all my stuff? It's in the bag. Okay, so those flowers, I made my flowers. I wonder if there's a way we can, should I hang it from behind me or what do you think? No, I'll just leave it here. I don't know if it's gonna stand on its own. Maybe, stay, okay. Um, I, the reason these little flowers become three-dimensional is I burned the edges to make them 3D. So we're gonna do an overhead and I'm gonna light a candle and I hope there's no smoke detectors in this room. <laughs> Let's see, turn it on. My mother got this lighter from QVC. She was very excited and I figured this was safe, safe to use in here. So I'm, I should have, I should have told you how to, cut, how to cut the circles first, but I got so excited that I forgot. So um, we're gonna bring the fabric to about a quarter of an inch from the flame. Can't do too close, can't do too far away. And we're gonna get an up close picture of this, even closer than you've got here. So hang on tight. Gabrielle is gonna do a, a different camera angle as I go around this thing. And I should, have, I should have told you how we cut it first, but you can see where it's melting. And of course, this isn't a handout. And we're gonna, in a minute, we're gonna put the handout again on the comments so you can click on it and print yourself a handout or look at it on another device. I think I've gone all the way around. So you can see, well, I didn't do very much over here. So, well, you get the idea. Um, you want to get close enough that it melts, but not too close that it burns. And sometimes I had a little fire happening, so I had to throw that one away and do another one. Um, so let me just real get rid of the candle and show you. This is, by the way, it's um, lining polyester. So if you come to our store, or it's, it's online, but if you come to our store and you're looking in the quilt room, there's a rack where we have all our sale stuff. It's on the other side of that rack. So here I am cutting a, um, oh, I did one end of the square, but that's okay. And if I had scissors, I'd be doing this, but this is, I'm literally just rounding the corners. That's, that's my circle right there. It's, it's a terrible looking circle, but that doesn't matter because um, I'm gonna burn the edges. Okay, so I use two different purples and two different whites. I think it just gives it a little more interest than having just one pink. Um, what did I say? Something in pink, something in purple. I meant to say pink. Anyway, there's three, four, five sizes. So let's pretend they were all um, curled up the way these guys are. And the only place that these are sewn down, again, is right in the center with the circles. That's free, just a little free motion design there. You could go back and forth. You could do whatever you wanted to nail these things down. Okay, so it's that simple. Polyester lining fabric, um, cut them into circles. The, cir the sizes are on the handout. We're gonna put the handout. Um, yes, a certain type of fabric pretty much has to be poly 
And this is polylining. So really inexpensive. Buy a quarter yard of a bunch of different colors and go to town. But um, yeah, fun project. I want Not done yet. Not done yet. Got to talk about leaves and stems. So here's my green. There's only one green that we found that I that I liked for stem. So here, here's the very complicated way that I that I cut a um a leaf. There's my leaf right there. Super easy. So you can cut, cut them all different sizes, of course, um, and then burn the edges just the way we did um, with the flowers. And there's my leaves and their different sizes. I sewed them down with just one little stitch here. You could do a little feather decorative stitch if you wanted to get a little fancier than I did. Um, the trickiest thing about this whole thing is remembering to stick it under the stem as you're sewing the stems, which I'm about to show you how to sew the stems down. So that, so far we've got flowers and leaves. And then, and then, get rid of all this. Boy, this has these little strings and they get everywhere. My husband was complaining they were between his toes the other day. And then we're gonna cut our stem fabric on the bias. So um, I measured, I had a ruler, but I'm just gonna, gonna do that. So there's my, there's my stem fabric and we're gonna fold it in half and sew it down. So let me show you how that's, and I've got some samples here. A second sample, there it is. So here it is. I've folded this down and I've sewn it down. So I've taken my, sometimes there's a shinier, prettier side. I'm not sure if this one has it. So I fold it in half. You don't have to press it in half. You just fold it in half. And if you can see my stitching line, this is the raw edge there. It's the raw edge. And so I sewed it uh, just a scant quarter of an inch away from the raw edge. And then when you fold this over, it covers everything up and you have a beautiful bias, bias, bias. So you can see that I've curved it um, and this is on the bias. So if you didn't do it on the bias, then it wouldn't curve. But this is an easy way to make a stem without having to turn that fabric right side out and then sewing it down on both sides. So raw edges are here, scant quarter of an inch there and flip it over. And by the way, if I didn't say it, this is supposed to be one and a half inches wide. That's, that's how that works. So hopefully that made sense. Um, there it is sewn down, of course, with white thread. And here I wanted to sew it down with green thread. And hopefully all of that is written down so you can understand it on the, um, on the handout. If you need a handout, we have put it in the comments. Does burning prevent fraying? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Um, we kind of clean up the edges. And then um, let's see. I wanted to talk a little bit about the quilting. Let's see if we can go, if we can look at the quilting on this. Actually, I'm going to do this side first. So this quilting is my diagonal uh, cross hatching. And I'm going to, I have a blog post that's listed on my handout. So I used a serpentine stitch after I marked my lines. I use a serpentine stitch to do that. And then check out the other side. I used a double needle. I believe we put the double needles in my, on my favorites page, but you can, with most machines, it's a simple one button press to get to your double needle. And then of course you need two, two spools of thread and a double needle, um, but it could not be easier. Look it up in your book. If you're not sure about all the settings um, on the back, of whatever it is, it's just gonna be this ugly zigzag, but that's okay because I line this so you can't see the back of my work so it doesn't really matter. Um, so yeah, I just quilted it two different ways just to talk about that. So on the handout is the blog post about how to do this. If you take my machine quilting with, with a walking foot, you will learn how to mark it and do this. But if you're too far away and can't take my machine quilting with walking feet, then you can look at my blog post. Um, do you ever make a stem this way with cotton? I imagine you could, Tina. Um, again, just cut it on the bias. I imagine you could do that, sure. How did you get the flowers to cup? That was the burning part. If you didn't catch the burning part, you can, when you're done, go back to the video and, and watch it burn. But I used a candle and uh, lit the candle and run the edge of the fabric quarter of an inch away from the flame is what worked for me. All right. So that was, that's fun. So we promised you that I'd play with fire. So that's, that's playing with fire right there. 
All right. Any other questions about the flowers? Oh, and then somebody was saying, I really want to put some on clothes. And I suggested that you can make a flower and then make it self, you know, self independent, right? Just sew through it all the way to the end and then put a safety pin on the back and then pin it to your shirt. So that were your headband or whatever, that would be an easy way to do it without actually attaching it permanently to the clothing. And then you have to figure out how to launder it. So, um, so yeah, that's another option. So really you could add flowers to quilts, to bags, to pillows, headbands, clothes, whatever. Okay. Hopefully that all made sense. And onward bound, I have another quilt, be well, two more quilts behind this, but here's one. Some of you may be familiar with an organization called Quilts of Valor. This will be going to Quilts of Valor um, when we're done talking about it today. Um, but Quilts of Valor is an organization that awards quilts to men and women who have been in the military and they're veterans and they've come home. So you can nominate anyone to get a quilt if they haven't gotten one yet. It's a national organization. They have a national database of everybody that's gotten one. And we actually have the Central Florida Quilt of Valor organization meets on the third Thursday for sew days. But if you don't want to come to sew days and you just want to make red, white, and blue quilts, um, I think their minimum is 60 by 70. They can go larger, but you can't go smaller. And they want you to put your best work into it. This is not, this is not a charity, you know, kid quilt that you're practicing things. They want you to put your best work because these are heirlooms that the family keeps forever and ever. So this is a scrappy quilt of valor. So I'm going to talk about how to make it. Here's the block right here. If you have the handout, you will see the block um, right here. And it's a square block, which means that I can checkerboard them back and forth and everything fits together. Okay. Quilted it with just a super simple spirally thing going there, which hits a lot of intersections, which this quilt has a lot of uh, seams. So I want to make sure my spirals hit as many seams as possible. So I'm going to cross over here and I'm going to go grab my my demos for this. Um, first of all, um, I want to talk about saving scraps. Um, so I'm sure all of you, if you've been quilting for any length of time, you have a little pile of scraps. You're like, okay, what do I do now? Well, I have a little bucket under my ironing board and just all done kinds of weird size pieces. Anything that's too small to fold back up and put in my, back in my stash, it ends up going in my scrap pile. So it'd be all kinds of colors. And then when, when it gets to too tall and doesn't fit anymore, it's time to take everything out. I happen to have an AccuQuilt cutter. So I will cut my pieces if they're long and skinny, either a two and a half inch strip or one and a half inch strip, or if it's too small, just pieces, I'll make, I'll do some rugs or some other stuff. And then if they're really big, I might make rice bags or drawstring bags with them. But most of what happens is I'm either cutting five inch squares, two and a half by five and a half, sorry, two and a half by five, or two and a half by two and a half. And I sort by color because I found that I like scrappy quilts that have not every single color in the rainbow, but maybe one or two. Maybe I'll make it just green, green and white, green and blue, something that's um, that works together on the on the color wheel. And I find those are to me a little more successful than every color in the rainbow. The quilt behind me, yes, there's red, white, and blue, but there's also some oranges and yellows, just to throw some happy yellow in there. Um, but you could certainly do that with all reds, whites, and blues as well. But I think I actually came up with this color idea from my friend Craig. Some of you know him. He's an amazing long armor. And he had something similar a couple years ago when I went to a, um, an award ceremony. I'm like, I like that idea. I, I just adds a little bit to the red, white. I make plenty of red, white, and blue quilts, but I like the addition of a few extra colors. So, um, so then we've got these pieces, these three sizes here in my bucket. So my greens are getting full, so it's time to make a green quilt. So I let's just look at the quilt behind me is made up of these guys. So we can do an overhead. So you can see I've got a four patch, a four patch, and a two patch. 
So you may have heard me talk about this before because this is one of my favorite things to talk about and it's in the handout, but it's MJ's Nifty 4-Patch. And I didn't organize these after this morning, but basically I'm going to show you how to make four patches like there's like nobody's business. This technique I use as my leader ender project. I always have a basket next to my sewing table. So when I'm piecing a chain of something, instead of cutting off the whole thing and that thread sometimes um, gets out of your needle, um, I've got a nail here that's coming off. Um, instead of their thread coming out of your needle, you park the thread with, it could be a scrap of fabric, but instead, why not have a basket of leaders and enders and every time you need to do a chain, run it off on a, one of these things and eventually you're going to have a whole bunch of scraps. Actually, I think I have enough of these to make a whole nother quilt. Um, so here's, here's how we do it. We're going to start with, sorry, I'm not organized here. We're going to, if I want to make this four patch, I need four, four fabrics and I just happen to have four, um, where are my, there it is four um, five inch squares. Here they are, okay? So I'm gonna take a light, put it on top of the dark, a light, put it on top of a dark, and and this gets piled up like this in my next to my in my sewing room. And so I, I know what to do. When I see one of these, I know I'm gonna sew along the side here, sew along the side here, sew along the side here, and sew along there. So I end up having something that looks like that. All right, so they're sewn on either side. Once you've sewn those, you're gonna cut it in half, exactly in half. So two and a half over here and two and a half over here. When you open them up, you're gonna have two of those, right? And then you're gonna have two of those. And now I take those to my iron, I've ironed them out, I'm making them look nice. Always press the dark, because now I can put a dark over a light, light over a dark. And if you've been doing this, you may not have heard my tip here, but I'll put a pin on one side and then I'll flip it over and I'll nest this seam and I'll sew it. That way, when I go to pick up the next one, it's ready. To, I mean, it's already pinned and it's ready to sew. So I'm going to sew. Here we go. I'm going to sew on either side this way. When I cut that in half, guess what I've got? I've got four patches galore. I don't know where my fourth one is. There it is. And I play with my colors. And so every, it doesn't have to be light, dark. It could just be all dark, all light, whatever. But again, this is, this is two four patches and a two patch. Okay, so Mary Janine, I understand what you did with the five inch squares, but what happens when you have these guys or these guys? You could still build them into four patches just the way I did before by grab one of these. Nope, grab a better one. So I can sew these two together and I'm in the middle of my process here. And I cut that in half, and then I have two twosies or sew it to something else. So you, just a process, it's all written down there for you on the handout. It's just a process that I'm continually doing with different color squares. Um, I have probably 10 different quilts I've made with these kinds of scraps so far and there's no end in sight. I think this was Costco something or other and it works really well for scraps. So if there's any questions, please let me know. I love my love questions. Um, you'll notice on your handout, one more thing with it to do with this block. Let's look at this block one more time. So here's the block. So I've got these guys. We talked about how to make that, but we didn't talk about how to make this yet. So because it's Quilt of Valor, if you become a member of the Central Florida Quilt of Valor, you get to shop for free at Marge Nix's um, garage. She has so much red, white, and blue fabric. So I rode my bike over there and I picked up some blue and some white and I cut it into one and a half strips. Here it is, one and a half strips. And you sew them end to end, just you need a million. I don't have a number for you. You could, you could say this, this is uh, four 10 and a half inch blues and two 10 and a half inch long white. So a lot of black, blue and white. So I sewed, sewed, sewed them together, put another blue on the other end. And that's the piece I'm gonna need. I'm gonna cut that 10 and a half inches. And one of those is gonna go on the top. And one of those is gonna go on the bottom of my scraps. So you get the idea. 
So it's a very simple block. I call it woven um, scraps because it is. It looks, it's looked like it's been woven together. So if you have questions, hit me up, please. Hopefully all that made sense. And I'm gonna move on to the next thing. All right, you see what? Never saw that four patch technique. Thank you, Gail. I came up with that on my own and I'm pretty proud of it. Um, next is flange. Yep, and like I said, it, great leader ender because it's a no brainer. You know, sometimes on Friday night, I'm just exhausted. I just wanna sew. I don't even wanna think about it. So I pick up a whole bunch of my um, four patch things and I just, just make a bunch of four patches just because you don't have to think at all once you get, once you get going on it. Um, okay, so flange binding. If you have never made a flange binding, I'm not even gonna show the whole quilt because that's not what I'm gonna talk about today, but flange binding is great. I don't know if you can see my finger, there we go, my finger underneath it. This is actually a three-dimensional thing. You may have seen flange binding at quilt shows. A lot of the award-winning quilts have flange binding, but guess what? Could not be easier. I would I'd tell you that this is almost easier than regular binding. Um, I don't do it on every quilt because let's back go back to this quilt here. Oftentimes your piecing goes right to the edge. And so you just want your binding to be a quarter of an inch and no more. This um, flange binding is a quarter of an inch plus the flange. So if it would piece to all the way to the edge, you might it might cover up some of that um, piecing and you don't want that. But when I have just yardage, you know, just fabric, that's a great time to use flange binding. So how do we do it? You are gonna measure around the quilt. Let's say you needed 200 inches of binding. You're gonna cut two and a, 200 inches of flange and 200 inches of the outside part of your binding. I'm gonna pull up the handout here. So I got this idea from um, Missouri Star and I've got the link here. She's got a great video in the, that I've put in the video, put in the handout. However, Jenny likes to have wider binding than I do. So these are Jenny's numbers and these are my numbers. I like quarter of an inch binding because again, if something is pieced, you don't want more than a quarter of an inch of binding. And that's just, and if you go to quilt shows, they're going to knock off if your binding is wider than a quarter of an inch, actually. So I've just always stuck with quarter inch binding. So um, those are your numbers. Your flange fabric is gonna be cut one and a half inch wide and your binding fabric is gonna be cut one and a quarter inch wide and you're gonna sew them end to end to end to end to end and then you're gonna sew the two pieces together. And that takes a little time. That's probably the hardest thing about this really and truly. Okay, so now that we've got that, we are going to fold this in half. And let me just say, if you've not heard me say this before, I no longer press my binding in half before I sew it down. You do not need to do that. And here's why. When you sew this down to the edge and you bring it around, uh, and I'm not doing it the way the flange, I'm just in general, there's gonna, if you think about it, there's a little less fabric needed on the inside than on the yellow outside. And if you force it by pressing that in half, it's not gonna come out as neat as it could as if you just let it naturally do its thing and it will fold a little differently than that fold that you press. So no, you do not need to press your binding in half. Um, even with this technique, you don't. And that saves a lot of burned fingers because I don't know about you, but I used to burn my fingertips when I was trying to fold this in half. So no more, no more pressing. Okay, so we've got all this and we're gonna sew it down. This is the back of the quilt. So I fold it in half and this yellow is actually my flange fabric and it's all written down here, but I'm going to sew it just the way I always sew my binding, <clears throat> sew it, miter the corner, miter it just the way you always do, fold it, miter it, turn it, all that good stuff. Uh, if you don't know how to do binding, come to my binding class or watch videos. And then when we fold this around, bring this down, you have this beautiful yellow miter that's going to pop out because you're going to take your stitch in the ditch foot and you're going to sew with black thread along the black edge there and that yellow will pop out as flange and look how nice the miters 
uh, if I had my glasses and I could get my fingers here right. This miter is beautiful as it is on this quilt. I'll show you, here's a corner here that, there it is. So that might not, probably is not my, one of my best corners. Here's a good corner. We'll show you the good corner. So, and I, it's, it's actually a scrappy flange because I was using all the leftover bits from this quilt. So this was a scrappy flange and that's certainly possible. possible. So uh, I'll talk about this quilt one of these days, but I just wanted, that's the only one I was rushing around this morning and that was the one I could find that I haven't sold or given away that had flange. I need to make more flange. So really and truly it's my, my favorite way to do binding. And I always do flange binding when I've got a quilt that has just fabric around the edge and it doesn't matter that the flange takes up a wee bit of that fabric. So if you have any questions about that, let me know. Everybody's following the directions with pound TT and T. If you're wondering, TTT, if you're wondering what they're doing, we're gonna put up a little graphic. We're giving away some gift cards at the end of the day or at the end of the uh, show. If you comment with a pound and all caps TTT, you could be the winner of a $25 gift card or a $10 gift card. So we will pull those numbers just before the end of the show. So hang in there. Um, hopefully we'll have your email. If you don't get emails from us, then you need to uh, let us know how to get hold of you if you see your name as the winner. Because hopefully we will have your email address. You know, I, I always forget to say this, but these handouts, by the way, have my email address and my website at the bottom. So if you're interested in learning about all the event quilting events happening in Florida, you're going to want to subscribe to my newsletter, Florida Quilt Network. It is free, my favorite word. All right, so we're going to continue on. I believe, what's next? Um, ah, this quilt is next. And the one behind me. So this is a pattern some of you may recognize called uh, Delectable Mountains. If you're a Bonnie Hunter fan, she calls it Scrappy Mountains. How much do the stitches show on the reverse side of the flange binding? I'm guessing, Judy, is that what you're asking me of the flange binding? Um, well, you're going to use the same color thread as what's on the back of your, the outside part of your binding. You, you're going to use that color top and bottom, and you're not going to see the stitches. So don't worry about that. Isabel Anderson, I have seen you on Facebook, but I haven't seen you here lately, so hi. Um, all right, let me fix this. So this is called um, Scrappy Mountains or Delectable Mountains, and I have another version here that same exact design, but laid out a little bit differently. So I'll just hold this up here for a moment. This is an old collection of Moda prints. Gosh, 10, 15 years old, probably. There's probably a date on here. Yes, there is. 2009, so a long time ago, I made this quilt. I remember I was, in a, I was in a condo in Ormond Beach and I went to the shop in Ormond Beach and I bought this pack, pack of 10 inch squares. It's like, what can I do? What? I remember laying them all out on the floor in the condo and figuring this out. So it, it was a fun thing. And then I just liked it so much. Some of you may know I collect red, white, and blue stripes and plaids shirt, shirtings, um, cotton shirts from the thrift store. And that this quilt is one of the many I've made with those shirtings. So let's talk about how to make these scrappy mountains. You'll notice there's two kinds of blocks. There's a downhill block and an uphill block. So you got to remember to make both kinds of blocks. We'll talk about that. And here is another version of the same idea, but this is called buzz saw. And the difference here is that, yes, I used a 10 inch square to make this, but if I add an extra piece here, then I end up with a square. Um, so here, so here's, here's the block. And then I added a, a solid piece and I ended up with a square. And that's how I was able to do the buzz, this buzzsaw look. Back it up here. These are actually, they look like squares, but they're actually rectangles. When you get, take a 10 inch square, half square triangle, and you cut it, to get, cut it apart and put it back together, you're gonna lose some this way. So it's actually a rectangle. So let's talk about how to make that. 
If you've ever, ever heard me talk at one of your guilds, you've probably seen this demonstration. This is a big hit. I always like to end my talk with this because it's so much fun. So here we go. If you want to make one block, you're going to take a light and a dark, and you're going to kiss them together, right sides together. And you're, of course, draw your line with your Frickson pen, whatever, chalk, whatever. It doesn't really matter because it's going to be in the seam. And you're going to sew a quarter of an inch on either side all the way down. When you cut on that drawn line, you're going to end up with two half square triangles. And we're just going to do it up the uphill and the downhill right here. So now what I have to do is I have to cut this into four equal columns. And I'm going to build it right here. Um, I'm going to cut it into four equal columns. And it's going to look something like this. In a minute, I'm going to back up. And I'm going to tell you, a, show you a really cool way to cut these into columns. But for now, sorry, i got to put this where you can see it. Actually, I'm going to leave this up here because um, we are going to build, build a block. So watch carefully. I'm going to take this piece and move it over here. And I'm going to move this back up. And there is my mountain. How cool is that? And the thing I'm going to show you next is even cooler. But that's, that's how you build one block out of a half square triangle. OK, so that's pretty cool in itself. But I also want to show you a really cool technique for cutting these into columns because you've got a square and you cut, you know, once you take a 10 inch square and you, you make a half square triangle out of it, this is going to be like, I don't know, nine and five a some weird number that you really do not want to get half a quarter. You know, you don't want to divide that by four. That's just ugly. So I've got a couple options for you. One option is you take two similar rulers and you kind of move it until you have the same amount of fabric on both sides. And okay. now I know I'm half and I can cut it. Do the same thing here and same thing here. That's a lot of work. Um, another option is to take this, fold it in half, press it, and then cut on the press line. Again, a lot of work. Um, my friend Marge, and I thought it was her, and she was there today. I said, did you show me this? She said, many years ago, this is a drafting idea that is very, very cool. Let's say I have a square. Let's say this is nine and a half. What is the next whole number? going up the, up the numbers, that's divisible by four. One, two, three, four. So if it's nine and a half, the next biggest number that's divisible by four is 12. I'm gonna, I just happen to have a 12 inch ruler. I'm gonna use this one. 12 inch ruler. This could be, if it was 16, you could use a 24 inch ruler, whatever. I just happen to have a 12 inch ruler, so I'm gonna use it. I'm gonna put my left corner of my ruler on the left wall, anywhere along here. I'm just gonna put it, I'll put it down below here. And now I'm gonna take my 12 inch point and it's gotta be on the other wall of the fabric. And I actually can move these up a little bit. So there it is. Now I can mark the three inch, the six inch and the nine inch. Brilliant, I have to tell you. Marilyn Logan, you want to put a comment just with pound TTT, nothing else. Um, so I'm going to do that one more time real quick. Let's say we had a um, 13 inch square and I needed to cut four pieces out of it. What's the next whole number above 13 that's divisible by four? That would be 16. So I could take a 16 inch ruler and, and do this, but I'm going to, we're going to go back to 12. So zero on the zero on the left wall and 12 on the right wall. And then I can mark the three, the six, and the nine. That is a good drafting tick, uh, trick that uh, anybody who drafts or architects for a living probably knows that trick. All right. Oh, I should tell you about um, Quilter Select Rulers. If you buy a Quilter Select Ruler from us, you get a free... Um, sewing studio this one doesn't say sewing studio the ones at home do um uh, pop top so it makes it really easy to lift this up and draw with it so i like having these on all my smaller rulers so i can just it's extension of my hand so love our my sewing studio pop tops i put this on there way before we were we got them here in the store any questions i know avi just brilliant 
any questions about, about this, I would be glad to answer if I possibly can. So lots of, lots of familiar names up there. Thank you all for showing up. And if there's no questions, I'm going to continue on. I've got two more things to show you. Um, this is an oldie but goodie. So last summer, we like to travel and we like to visit people. And I uh, needed a little gift for everybody along the way that we were visiting with. So I made everybody some pot holders. So we actually still have pot holder fabric um, in a batik. And we have two or three that are in the novelty section of fabric. And we actually have this one still. I should have looked up the number, but we can we can find that number if you're interested. Um, so this is pot fabric, of course, cannabis. Um, this is a smaller version of the pot holder. And then the one I, what I've got here are larger versions, but it's the same idea. Put your hand in here. There's insole bright and batting inside so you won't burn your hands. So we're going to do a quick little demo on how to make pot holders. So yep, overhead here. So here's what it looks like. Um, I'm going to have you follow along in your handout. Let us know if you don't have the handout yet, but it is, um, you can bring it up on another device or you can print it out. So it looks like this. Let's see, was there a handout for the mountain cutting technique? Good question, Tina. There is not. Um, if you go to quiltville.com, which is Bonnie Hunter's website, and, you know, send me an email because I might have it. I might have just forgotten that I'd written one up. Send me an email, and if I don't have it, I'll send you a link for it. My hand, my email's at the bottom of all my handouts, so let's do it that way. But Scrappy Mountains is her, is Bonnie Hunter's thing. She doesn't have that drafting technique that I just did, but she's got everything else. Okay, so One Step Magic Pot Holder. Um, you're going to follow along here where it says lay out in this order. And this morning, I made everybody yell out the numbers, but since you can't yell out, we're just going to ha have to do it myself. So the first order of business is to put down one piece of cotton batting. Again, mine were 10 inches, probably a little bigger, probably a little too big. You probably want to go a little smaller. You could do, I think these pot holders, I started out seven and a half inches. Um, and then once you put the borders on there, they end up being um, seven inches, well, maybe eight inches. Maybe I started out at eight inches. And then when I'm finished with everything, they finish up at a little over seven inches square. Okay, back to this. So a piece of cotton batting. Insel Bright is on my favorites page. It's also um, here at the store if you just want to come in and get that. Um, I made a pot holder once, not this style, but another style for a friend. And she, she managed to burn her fingers on it with one thing of Insel Bright. So now I put cotton on either side of the Insel Bright just to be, just to be not sued or something. I don't know. Um, okay, the third thing is another piece of cotton batting. The fourth thing is your 10 inch square. I didn't talk about how to cut all your pieces, but that's all on the handout. So 10 inch square, and we're gonna put it right side up. Good old onions. And then the two finger flaps. So I tell you how to, what size to cut these. And then we're gonna fold them and press them in half. So the raw edges go next to the raw edge of the table, uh, oh, sorry, pot holder. I'm gonna tell you in a minute why I'm calling it magic. And then finally, this is my magic piece of fabric. Oh, no, one more thing. Uh, hanging loop. Love me some scotch tape. It's a whole lot easier to use scotch tape to lay that down than it would be to try to pin it and make it stay. So scotch tape, tape is your friend here. And then finally, the magic fabric. It's cut almost the same size as our first piece of fabric. It's the same height. It's just not the same width. And we're going to put that right side down. The magic of this is that you get to sew all the way around. You do not need to leave a turning hole um, because of this magic piece of fabric. Um, somebody, oh, yeah, so we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah, so all the way around. I like to round the corners a little bit. I just like that look a little bit rather than the, the sharp edges because sometimes those points don't come out. So I will just kind of eyeball with my walking foot as I go around the edges round edges. Okay. So that's, that's what that looks like. I got to turn this into that. So then you can see what, how we turn these right side out. It's so much fun. Okay, here we go. There's my piece with the magic piece on top. 
And again, it's magic because I get to sew all the way around. I was teaching, doing a lecture in Bunnell recently, and they had a whiteboard with all these instructions on the whiteboard. Like, what, what is this? They said, oh, last time you came, you told us how to do these, and now we teach all the 4-H kids. This is how they learn how to sew, was making these pot holders. So that's pretty good. Um, so here we go. You can just leave the camera there. We're gonna flip the uh, magic piece of fabric over, and then we're gonna flip the finger folds. What did I call them? Yeah, finger flaps. There, done. I had to do two, 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 uh, two versions, and there's my hanging loop. Got to have a hanging loop on a pot holder. You can't see it because because uh, my shirt is the same color. So there's the pot holder. I like to sew a little line down. It just makes it easier to fold in half if you have a line that's sewn all the way through. Plus, that means nobody can turn your pot holder right side out or right side in. So if there are any questions about the pot holder, love to see them. Pot holders do make the best gifts. Um, last trip, I must have made, I don't know, 10 or 12. Everybody got two and I had two left over. Um, but yeah, everybody everybody can use a new pot holder once in a while, right? Because they get, they get all kind of nasty after a while. So good gifts. Um, somebody today was buying three yards. She bought three yards of the cannabis fabric to make them for all her bridge partner ladies. So um, yeah, the technique is fantastic, especially for those who don't want to do binding. Absolutely right. No binding, no uh, having to close up a little hole with hand stitching. It's magic. All right, one more thing for you guys. Um, and that is, so when I teach my machine quilting class, I tell you about, I'm gonna turn this over for a minute. <laughs> I tell you about uh, 11 different ways to mark your quilt for quilting. Having said that, I rarely mark my quilts for quilting. Um, I usually either use the, the piecing to inform my quilting or um, I use the lines to do something with. I try to let my quilt do my marking for me, but every once in a while I need to mark something. Here is an example, we'll do O head now. Here's an example of a design a few years ago I really wanted this, it needed to be bigger. It's called Wondrous Waves. I forget the name of the person that'll come to me eventually. I have several of her books, but this is for an eight inch block. I need, needed it to be a 12 inch. So I took it to my printer, made it larger. Of course, that's not the whole thing, but that's okay because all four sides are the same. So I, this is what I want. So crinoline. Crinoline is a netting. Just move this out of the way for a, minute, for a minute. Crinoline is a kind of a stiff netting. I also tried just plain netting, which was not stiff enough. And I also tried bridal tool, which is definitely not stiff enough. It's very flowy. I need something that was kind of like very stable. So crinoline won that won that prize, um, won that award, and I, I use a Sharpie and I, I wrote on here the top because I want to be sure this thing can be backwards and forwards and you know you could see the Sharpie on both sides. So I, I wrote top so I would know. And I traced my design with a Sharpie on the crinoline. And I had to move my fabric around a few times to get the whole thing on there, but I did. I got it all on there and you could see that. Not beautiful actually. And now we're going to do a, a, a Big shot here. Now I can take this onto my quilt and I can mark my quilt with a chalk marker or not a Frixon, but any other type of marker that I know is gonna wash out of my quilt. I'm not gonna go into markers today because that's a whole nother topic, but that would be a way to transfer a pattern from a piece of paper to a quilt. And sometimes people say, Mary Janine, just, I know you got 11 ways. Just tell me your best, the best way. But there isn't really one because it depends on where your pattern's coming from and where it's going. Am I gonna wash the quilt or not? Am I, is it dark, is it light? Um, do I, you know, if the marks don't completely disappear, is it gonna be okay? So there's lots of different things. That's why I have so many different ways to mark a quilt in my machine quilting class. But here's another thing. This is the whole reason I am talking to you about this. Over Christmas, I was, I still haven't finished this actually. We'll do an overhead. This is a wool applique and I love doing handwork. 
This is actually, I'm still in the middle of this, but these buttonhole stitches. This is something that I enjoy doing when I'm in the car because our car is a little bumpy going down the road. And if I don't hit the exact spot, it doesn't matter. It adds to the charm of it. Um, if you're interested in this wool felt, email me. I have a, a good source for these die cut circles. You do not want to be cutting circles out by hand, that's for sure. Here's the point. So here's the pattern. Pick this up at a quilt show. And it was all very primitive, folk arty colors, didn't like it at all, but I knew I could do it with, with these bright, happy colors. So you open up the pattern and you get this. And I'm like, okay, how do I get this to my felt? So out comes the crinoline and I, whoop, there's the top. So I traced it with my uh, red Sharpie, just, I don't know, I could use black, I guess, but I used red. So I traced all the markings and everything. And then that goes down. I'll turn this over so you could see it's a little easier to see. And that goes down. And then I can mark through the crinoline and mark where my little wool pennies are going to go. So this, by the way, is wool um, applique. Um, I put a little guy on top of a medium guy on top of the white guy or the biggest one and then applique applique down. And what is it going to be? It's just a little frou-frou thing for my Christmas Christmas table somewhere. I just It just makes me happy. So uh, hopefully that helped put crinoline on your list of tools to for your quilting if you do some of your own quilting. Could you use stabilizer instead of crinoline? You've got to be able to see through it and you've got to be able to draw through it. The idea here is that I am drawing through the netting onto the fabric. That's why I like the crinoline because you can get through it, but it's still stable. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, good question though. Um, I think, I think that's everything. Thanks for sticking with me. I know you're here for the drawing, but thank you for sticking with me anyway. So we, you have one last two seconds to type hashtag TTT if you have not put in for the door prize. And then we are going to start our magic randomizer and it's going to pull up two names. The first name is going to win the $25 gift card from the sewing studio. And the second name will win the $10 gift card from the sewing studio. So off we go here. I don't know. Can they see that? No, they can't see that. So we are going to click on draw and it's going through all the names of all the people that put hashtag TTT and the winner is... Krista Weaver. Congratulations, Krista. I'm pretty sure we've got your email around here somewhere. So congratulations, Krista. You win the $25 gift card from the sewing studio. And now we're going to draw a second time. And that person is going to win a $10 gift card. So good luck, everyone. And the winner is D Stell, S-T-E-L. So congratulations, D. So I think that's everything we wanted to say. Thank you so much for joining me. And if you needed to catch anything, you can rewind and watch it as much as you want. All right. Have a good rest of your weekend, guys. See you soon. Bye-bye.